All right, in part two here, what we're gonna be discussing is birds. A lot of things as it relates to birds. And it's a really good opportunity. It's what I call for those that have really good situational awareness in the outdoors, birds are the cheat. And they'll tell you almost everything that you need to know about what's going on in the outdoors. And it's, it's very interesting. It's a subject that you really need to pay attention to and dig into. But once you do, it's one of those things that your Daniel Boones, your Simon Kittens, your Native Americans, they all knew bird language incredibly well. And they may have not known why birds did certain things or uh, were vocal about things in a certain way, but you can be assured that they knew what was happening when they heard certain bird language. So that's what I'm gonna try to cover for you today. And then I'm gonna go out in the woods and we're gonna walk around and talk about some of this stuff. So I don't know if you can pick it up, but while you're, uh, while we're sitting here doing this, there's a little black cat chickadee that's right behind the, where the camera's sitting right now. And we had just been out in the woods. We came back, we're right here. And that black cat chickadee is alarming, okay? That's what we would refer to as danger because this is the language that birds understand and talk about. There's a whole lot more to this, but let's break this down. They talk about food, they talk about danger, and they talk about sex. So for those of you out there that are turkey hunters, you already know this. There's certain calls that are, that are just purring calls. They're calls that are just uh, calming calls. When they get alarmed, they'll talk about, or they'll get real loud, they'll get really fast. If something's saying pop, 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 you know, that's the kind of noise that most birds make. And then when they have uh, the need to have sex or they're trying to attract a mate, there's certain sounds that they will make. Like a grouse will drum with its wings. A gobbler will gobble uh, and any number of things. Here's the thing that we need to know. For those of us that hunt turkeys, for example, or know about grouse, or take the time to just watch robins in our backyard, we know that these things are true, but here's what we know. That's true about all birds. They all have vocalizations that are similar to this. You just gotta tap into it and start to pay attention to what they're saying, okay? The next thing, and this is what we'll walk out into the woods and talk about, is they also have certain flight patterns and they have corridors of travel. Now this is a little bit more advanced as far as uh, naturalist training, but this is incredibly valuable to survival and bushcraft, and I'll make sure I'll get that across to you. But let's break every one of these down, and I'll show you to how to apply it to survival and bushcraft. First one I'm gonna talk about is food. So if you're the type of person that might have a backyard feeder or something, this is a fantastic thing you can just do in your backyard, is pay attention to the birds that are coming to the feeder and what kind of sounds they make when they're just, they might pick up a seed and they'll fly off and they'll eat that seed or they might stay right on the feeder and eat that seed. And they'll probably make some kind of call while they're doing that. That is a call that, that they're making when they're just at ease and everything's okay. Now, how does that apply to us in survival bushcraft? Well, number one, let's say that we're hunting. Let's say that we're going through a wilderness area and we want to walk silently. Let's say we don't want to be found. We're hunting. We don't want anything to know that we're there. Here's what I can assure you. If you make sudden movements and birds start to start making danger sounds, you can be guaranteed that other animals in the area know that those are danger sounds and they'll pay attention to them. That might not change their behavior, but oftentimes it'll be the one thing that kind of twitches that deer's ear or brings attention to whatever critter that you might be going after and it starts paying a little bit more attention than it already was, okay? There was a fantastic study done at the University of Wisconsin a number of years ago where they took, a, they took a, an actual owl, a live owl, put it in a box and surrounded by glass so that it couldn't fly away and covered it and hung it on the side of a tree. And then they placed microphones out through the forest, out for, I can't even remember how far it was, it was something like two miles, it was crazy. But they surrounded the tree with microphones and put them out in, in, in a radius out away from that particular tree. And then they had a remote control button that this lifted off the cover. And so all of a sudden, right in the middle of the forest, boom, there's an owl there. And what they then, then did is recorded how fast it took for birds to start alarming throughout the forest. And what they determined is that the birds started alarming in a radius out from that tree at about 75 miles an hour, like boom. Everything started alarming out away from that tree. 
That is indicative of what happens in the forest when we're around it. Uh, I've told this story many times, but for many, many years of my life, I'd only seen maybe two bobcats, wildcats, in the outdoors. I hadn't just seen a lot of them, just didn't come across a lot of them. And then I started studying bird language when I was a young man in my early 20s, I'm 50 now, and birds will alarm when they see a bobcat. And so they'll alarm at a lot of things actually, but when they start to alert for danger or alarm, and I'm keyed into that, keyed into not only just turkeys and robins, but black cat chickadees and nuthatches and warblers and all the things that are out here. When you get keyed into listening to, okay, that bird is alarming, look that direction. That's when I started seeing, I can't tell you how many bobcats I've seen now. So um, that's the sort of thing that paying attention to bird language will give you the ability to recognize even corridors of travel for other animals that maybe you wanna hunt, maybe you wanna take pictures of, uh, maybe it is something that you want to trap, but that bird language is going to help you out a lot. Now, we're going to talk about sex. Sex. This is not the same sex talk you got from your parents when you were a teenager. At least I hope you got that sex talk. <laughs> uh, with that said, so birds really like to talk about and have uh, particular sounds for mating. And if you get keyed into that, then you can also, as a wildlife habitat study, learn where there's male and female birds. You know, grouse is just the obvious choice. If a male grouse is drumming on a log, then you know that there's at least a male grouse there. Maybe you want to study that, maybe you want to hunt that, depending upon how many grouse are in your area. But it's one of those things that if you can start to recognize that different birds are talking about sex and they're communicating each other so they can get together. This time of year for me in the spring, there's two red-tailed hawks that have nested here for a long time and they'll they'll do their mating calls and I just just for the sake of nature study I love looking at red-tailed hawks here's how that applies to survival and bushcraft they'll do these mating calls in the spring and they'll try to find each other and, and I can find their nest when I find their nest even in large section of forest I then know that that hawk has everything that I need as well it has shelter it has water it has food so if it uses similar shelter I do, which it doesn't necessarily, but it needs water so I can probably find water. And it also has food like it grabs small animals, then I too can find those resources just by knowing that, hey, these two birds are communicating in such a way that they're finding the resources that I need and can apply that to my survival in bushcraft. So now let's go out here and talk about flight patterns and corridors in the woods and I'll show you how that applies here as well. All right, guys and gals, let's apply some forest ecology practice and understanding into birds and how they act and then apply that over to survival and bushcraft. So you'll notice over here on this side of me, we're mostly looking at deciduous trees. We're looking at oaks, we're beeches, uh, poplars, any number of trees that are uh, out there that are rather uh, food sources for a lot of critters, uh, homes if they have nesting cavities in them. But here's what we also know. Over here on this side, we have conifers. Conifers are trees that ha produce cones like this particular Virginia pine that are in here. Here's what we know about bird activity. So birds will go out into this area. Uh, there's an open area behind where you're viewing me from, where the camera is. And they'll go out here, find the seeds, find the bugs that they need to eat, and then they'll fly back in into here because this provides the cover. So again, over behind you during the winter time, late winter, I feed birds because it's a very difficult time for particularly songbirds to find food. And so I, it's the only time of year that I feed birds when it's really difficult for them to find food. But I've sit and watch birds for hours at a time, go to the feeder and then come back into these Virginia pines and eat their seed. They'll go get their food and then come back out. Uh, the birds that get conditioned to eating off of bird feeder 12 months out of the year, they don't typically do that. They lose that animalistic uh, self-preservation mindset. That's why I don't feed birds all year long. But um, understanding that helps us to understand, for example, if I'm out in the middle of the woods and then all of a sudden I start seeing some cardinals and I see that they're going to a different direction, a specific direction they're probably going into an open field that maybe I have no idea where it is. They also, like we talked about with the hawks, they have to go to water too at some point in time. So if the other thing that we don't see from down here on the ground, if we were to get up in the canopy, and there's a lot of study that's done on this as well, is that there's actually, you can think about it like tunnels, if you will. 
that go down through the forest canopy and birds will have intersecting tunnels, if you will, in a canopy in a wooded area. So if you sit and watch and pay attention, that's why we ref refer to having a sit spot, then you can see where these birds go through these travel corridors on a regular basis, okay? So again, if you're a photographer, boom, 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 you can get the photography that you want. Or if you're a naturalist, survivalist, bushcrafter, then you can pay attention to where they're going to and from water to go find your own water, okay? You can just let the birds guide you. Now, as far as that is, uh, he, as far as relating that to deer hunting, for example, um, here's how you can apply it to hunting deer and knowing that deer are coming. This is how I say that, that birds help you cheat in deer hunting all the time, is that they have these travel corridors. So let's say that I'm sitting in a blind or a deer stand or just sitting on the ground, and I, within a real quick short time of sitting on the ground, I can start to see these travel corridors, and you can too if you pay attention. Just see these typical travel corridors where these birds are traveling, and then you'll notice every once in a while, particularly birds that are traveling like this, all of a sudden they just go up. That's because they sense danger. Now that again could be the bobcat we were talking about earlier. That could be that a deer's running or coming to you and it's just, it's causing so much commotion in the woods that it alarms the bird and they don't even know why they're, they're flying like that. But because predators oftentimes will get them down here, they'll swoop up and get into higher places like these Virginia, Virginia pine and stuff of that nature. And the reason they're doing that is they are again escaping that danger and you utilizing the study of language, studying the corridors and paying attention where they're flying, you're gonna be able to sense more things as they're coming on around you for, again, hunting or trapping or whatever you wanna use them for. I told you it wasn't the same sex talk you had before. Food, danger, sex, flight patterns and corridors. Birds can tell us all kinds of stuff just by you getting out and paying attention. That's why it's productive for you at times to just go in the woods and sit. Sit there, pay attention. Listen to what the birds are saying. See if you can see variances or differences in how they communicate. Can you see the variances and difference in how they fly? Okay. Now, if you want to dig into this subject, there's a fantastic book called uh, What the Robin Knows by John Young. Probably one of the best books out there about this subject. Uh, if you want to study with us, then come back. Uh, this is one of the subjects we were going to teach at Georgia Bushcraft. And um, come to the Nature Reliance School. We'd love to have you. We have classes called Nature Immersion Classes. And in that we do, again, a weekend of stuff like what we're talking about in this particular course. And we teach you and show you even more ways to learn what's going on out here and apply it to what it is that is survival and bushcraft and daily life. So we'll come back in just a moment for part three, where we're gonna be looking at baseline, which is a whole lot of tracking. Thanks for joining me.